Thank you very yes. much, Zoomers, for once again coming along and joining us on an In Conservation With, which is sponsored by Leica Sport Optics. Um, tonight, this afternoon, this morning, my guest is Silas Olofsson, uh, a man that I met, I just realised actually, I met you four years ago, I believe this month, four years ago, on a rainy day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In on the Isles of on on the Faroe Isles, yep. I was I was on a press trip, a general press trip, looking at the sort of architecture and the food and stuff, and I was craving to go and do a bit of birding, and I managed to reach out to you, and you had a spare hour, and that was one of the best hours I had on that. Well, in fact, that was the best hour I had in the whole week, even though it was pouring of rain. So Silas, how are you, and where are you? Well, I am. Um in my hometown in called Kranasund on the Faroe Islands, um, on the northernmost island of the Faroe Islands. And I'm really doing well. So, good. What I like about this fellow uh, is the fact that he's a, a conservationist, he's a birder, but he's a finder, which uh, is a term that the Icelandic birders use, um, because in Iceland, you can only see up to maybe 300 species of bird and then after that anything else you, you see you found um, so you have to seek it and in places like the Faroes and on Iceland um, you have I suppose less species normally you know to be seen in a day so you have to work that much harder to find them am I right in saying that you are perfectly right it's um Typical, the further north you get, the fewer species you get, but you also get the huge numbers, like we have 2 million fulmars on the islands. So, so we have a lot of birds, but very few species. Well, we'll talk about, we'll talk about the actual finding and what birding is like on uh, the Isles, uh, on Faroe Islands. I keep on trying to say the Isles of Sea, on Faroe Islands in a, in a moment. Yeah. But what I want to find out firstly, is about you and about your your beginnings um you know where did you come from and how did you get into the uh, the fine art of birding well um i grew up in the village of uh, fuglafjord which actually translates bird fjord um it's like half an hour's drive from here and um i like to go fishing and i, I was fishing pretty much every day uh, after school and stuff but you know when you don't catch anything uh, you well, I started to look for birds, and I started to notice different species of gulls. And in winter, all of a sudden, you saw these really white gulls that were Iceland gulls and uh, Glaucus gulls. And I got really interested in seeing these kind of different birds. And I had a really good biology teacher in school who was really good at just you know inspiring me to go birding. And I actually remember my first twitch it was um a flock of uh brand geese that were uh, that he had seen uh, in the morning um just in our village in the bay and uh after school he told me about this flock of birds that were down in the bay and he said he wouldn't tell me uh, in the morning because then he <laughs> he was sure that i would skip school to go and see them so i went down there and actually managed to to see these pale bellied uh, brands and I, after that, I just got really, really excited. Uh, started going around uh, birding, but um, you know, on the Faroe Islands, there are not a lot of bird watchers at all. So uh, it's actually when I, uh, well, I was all, uh, all the time I was really interested, but um, I had, um, I went to high school actually in Denmark and there I had a German teacher who um, who was really a really really keen birder, and pretty much every weekend we went out birding, and that's from where I really to, uh, or learned the craft of birding. Because it's not something that just comes to you; it's something you need to learn, uh, and it takes hundreds and hundreds of hours, you know, to to be able to identify the different birds and. Then I started traveling around and uh, I went actually with my teacher to Florida, to Spain, actually, uh, to Montreal, um and uh, to uh, 
uh, Germany to uh, to northern Sweden and you know got to see a whole lot of birds and you know the thing is that the more you know about a subject the more interesting it gets right and you know so so I pretty much skipped fishing and now it's all about birds and yeah now I'm just really really into it can you tell us a bit more about the Faroe Islands themselves? Because I remember when I went there, I was quite surprised by, you know, what I saw in terms of the, the topography and the layout of the land, really. Yeah, well, the Faroe Islands are placed between Iceland and Scotland. And uh, it's uh, inhabited by the, the, the Vikings. They came here. Uh, gene genetic studies are quite interesting because it shows that all the women descend from, uh, from the Celts, or the Irish and Scottish, where all the men come from Norway. So, so uh, the Vikings have seem to have uh, waged war against the, the the Irish and the Celts and uh, taken all their women. So, um, well, the Faroe Islands are like the top of mountains just sticking out of the ocean, uh, really steep um, with no natural forest um but rick really rocky terrain uh but with a lot of grass um due to, to due to the gulf current it doesn't get really really cold even though this winter was the coldest winter for 27 years but it's not like the the fjords uh, the ocean freezes here only very rarely we have a thin layer of ice um and uh, yeah generally it's um it's so remote there are no natural occurring uh, mammals uh, on land for instance um only you know mice and rats and rabbits and hares that have been released here and sheep of course we have a lot of sheep uh, but we have a really rich uh, bird life because of all the with the seabirds that breed here on the islands. And we also have, um, you know, whales, we have seals, and you can see all kinds of animals, uh, you know, that live in, this, the, in the ocean. Okay, we'll get back to the subject of whales in a second, because that's, as we say in England, the elephant in the room, we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> Even though the elephant and whales are different, anyway, um, how many how many islands are there on the Faroes or in the Faroes, comprising the yeah. Faroes, and uh, how big a space is that? And also, how many people live on Faroe Islands? And of those, how many are birders? <laughs> well, there are eighteen islands. Um, uh, Seventeen of them are inhabited, uh, but. Uh, half the people actually live in the capital. Uh, so you have a lot of space where you just have nobody. And you have many areas, you know, remote valleys where people come twice, three times, four times a year. So you have some really, really remote and desolate places here, which is really good for the birds and, uh, and stuff. Um, and uh, Total population is about 50,000 people, um, and the uh, total landmass is 1,400 square kilometers. So you have a little more than 30 people uh, per square kilometer, which is one of the lowest densities in, in uh, all of Europe. So, well, you have a lot of, well, kind of untouched nature if you don't take into consideration the, the, the grassing of the sheep. And I think that's one of the things that that strike many Europeans that come here, that it's really quite untouched in many places. Um, and uh, how many birders are there? Well, um, there are a lot of people who are interested in birds, you know, looking out the, the windows, feeding the birds. And uh, of course, birds are also hunted for food, uh, like fulmars and um, to a lesser degree, other species are being uh, harvested every year. Uh, so people know about those uh, birds too, and it's been going on for a thousand years. Um, but birders like me that, you know, 
uh, try to find rarities, look at the weather forecast, you know, look at the bird news from Iceland and Shetland and Europe to see what could be out there. Well, you only have very few. Okay. Like, yeah. You know, I, I could I could say that, you know, um, several times I found a new species for the country and nobody even attempted to twitch it. That sounds like heaven on earth. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, so yeah. what I want to ask now, I mean, let's let's talk, let's go straight to the elephant before we carry on. Yeah. People's perceptions of the Faroe Islands are or is that the, you're, you're a nation that hunts whales. Um, yeah. Even today on Twitter, someone uh, made a comment under the tweet I put out about your coming tonight, saying, how can you promote the Faroe Islands when they kill whales? How can you promote the wildlife? My response, by the way, Silas, was, um, well, how can I promote wildlife in the UK when we kill hen harriers, badgers and foxes? And I, said, and I then went on to say, but I will promote conservationists, birders and their stories from the Faroe Islands because I think it's important that people get to know the stories. So can you just tell us what the situation is, you know, in terms of the whale hunting and in terms of what the general mindset is on the Faroes? Well, uh, first of all, the mindset is definitely changing. Um, uh, when I was a kid, we, we were actually eating quite a lot of whale beef. Uh, uh, and it was a really common thing to eat back in the days. I just heard last week uh, when people were asked, they were eating it less than once a month. Uh, so it's getting actually really quite rare to, to eat whale whales anymore. Um, especially since the whales are actually becoming so contaminated that um, that uh, they are full of mercury, and doctors say that you know pregnant women should never eat it, uh, and most people should try to eat it as rarely as possible. And uh, people are not hunting a lot of whales anymore. It's definitely a thing that is declining very much on the Faroe Islands. Uh, and of course, if you go 100 years back, 200 years back, whale meat was like the survival uh, food here. Because you live off nature and you can grow potatoes. You can barely grow uh, any, um, any crops other than potatoes and some rhubarbs and stuff like that. Um, so you were really dependent on sheep on birds, on fish, and on whales uh, for, for, for uh, sustenance, right? Uh, now it's very different. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, my uh, when I eat meat, it can come all the way from, uh, uh, from Brazil, Brazil or, you know, from South America, or you get a lot of chicken. You know, you can buy anything that you can buy in the UK, and we actually do import quite a lot of stuff from from uh, from you guys, um, yeah. So the 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 whale hunting is still going on, but it, it's a fraction of what it used to be. Um, um, a few hundred whales a year are uh, being taken, and it's a it's very much a declining thing now, and um, and. My guess is that it will stop eventually. Uh, even, you know, most of the younger people will not even eat it anymore because it's so contaminated. And, you know, it tastes, it has a strong taste. So, uh, so if people, you know, most people don't even like it anymore. Um, that being said, uh, the, the population of the longfin pilot whale uh, around the Faroe Islands is estimated to many, many hundred thousand whales. Uh, so um, um, if you look at sustainability, uh, actually whale meat would be something of the most sustainable uh, food sources uh, there are. Um, 
because there's no transportation involved, nothing else. And, and uh, you only take a fraction of the birth surplus uh, of the whales that are around here. So it's not like you're exterminating uh, a whale species, but it's definitely something that is declining. And yeah, give it some time and it will die out on its own, I think. I mean, that's one of the things I found very uncomfortable about my visit. And I've been to the Faroes twice now and I felt uncomfortable on both occasions because of that. I remember being on a boat with you going from one island to another and a whale, a big whale, I'm not sure what it was, might have been a sea whale, um, breached, yeah. not breached actually, just came up and blew, you know, had a, had a blow. And yeah. I was just about to shout out to you, whale! But instead I went, because I thought if I shout it out, then you know, and that's the that's that's what's ingrained in a lot of us living outside of the Faroes. But I think, you know, I've always been of the mind that you know boycotting places it just doesn't work because it gets me it gives me the impression, but it kind of legitimizes people. They kind of think, well, in that case, if you ain't coming, we're going to carry on anyway. You can't tell us what to do. And I'm of the mind that if you visit places. Um, I mean, for example, last uh, on Monday we had a lady, Alice Tribe, from uh, who, who's working in Malta, and she's essentially saying, "Don't boycott Malta. Come, because when you come, you're in the face of the hunters, and they feel embarrassed or they can't do what they can do, and it kind of helps the situation." And I just feel that maybe, I mean, in a way, it's a happy accident, in a, which is a terrible accident, by the way. But the the, the whales with mercury is now affecting people's attitude towards hunting them. But I also got the impression when I was there, and I spoke to several people other than yourself, and the impression was that people were kind of thinking, well, we've, we've done that, we don't need to do it anymore. Yeah. Um, but it becomes something that's stuck in, in certain groups, like in the UK, with our hunting, it's in a certain echelon of society. I got that, got that feeling from the pharaohs. I remember contacting the tourist board afterward and saying, I'd like to write a piece about, you know, my trip and when do you foresee the well hunting going? And they said, well, we don't care. It's part of our tradition. And if you don't like it, don't come. And I thought, well, that's not a good attitude. And that's from the top, as it were. But when you speak to people on the ground, I've got a very different feeling from that. So I just hope that, um, you know, people like you talking about um, the islands, and more people visiting, like myself, writing about it, and also experiencing what you're about to tell us about, mm. will change attitudes. You know, the more ecotourism may mean that people will suddenly realize, well, actually, why don't we just stop doing that? We're making loads of money in our bed and breakfast and what have you, or our restaurants. Let's just keep attracting that. So hopefully that balancing, that tipping point will come at some point. Yeah, and I've actually been working myself and with whale monitoring to find out if we can do some of the same things as they do in Iceland in order to, you know, get a different income from the whales uh, around the Faroe Islands. And it's also very important to me that it's actually only one species that you're allowed to hunt. All the others are completely protected, like the, the big whales. Uh, it's only the longfin pilot whale that is well that is still open uh, for 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 hunting okay. and it it's yeah all the others are 100 percent protected okay well that's something that i didn't realize i mean i'm sure a lot of people in the uk and elsewhere no. perhaps didn't realize so, so that's so, another reason why you need to visit and see for yourself okay um yeah, let's yeah, yeah. let's move on to tonight's subject uh i noticed behind you there's a uh <laughs> as you termed it a, a hall of fame behind you yeah yeah it's yeah you can see it here uh it's all the species that i've found uh, as national firsts on the Faroe islands and, and that's something that i'm and i really like to to find species that have never been recorded in the island on the islands before like finding a new to britain right yeah but how often can anyone say they found a new bird for britain i bet there's no one in this zoom room that's found a new bird for britain let alone the waterfall you got up there <laughs> yeah um, i want to quickly before you tell us about some of the birds you've seen i want to quickly share my screen uh with, the, with you guys and the zoomers to show you a little excerpt of when Silas and i were together in the pharaohs or on the pharaohs and we've just seen um 
the Faroe Islands second ever uh, Bonaparte skull. So if you want to see any of this, by the way, clearly, please go to, um, uh, don't go off, get off uh, gallery view, go on to speaker view to see this. And I hope you, can you see this? Can you see a black square? Can you see it? Okay, yeah. yeah. very exciting moment. We're in um, the CLS's hometown. We just have to drive past. There was a bunch of gulls sitting in on the beach. Hello, the estuary. Uh, and uh, Silas noticed a, a smaller gull amongst them. And we just uh, had to look at it, and all of a sudden, we realised it was a Bonaparte gull, which is a, a rare transatlantic vagrant. In fact, I think. Silas has only seen one in this country and it's the first one he's ever found and also it's in his hometown so we're driving cross country now because it flew off immediately we didn't get any pictures so we're heading off to an area where it flew to to see if we can try and locate it okay okay So it turns out that the uh, Bonaparte skull that we've just briefly seen is uh, the Faroe Islands' second ever. Yes! We did it! <laughs> That's good. So what we're doing now is we are heading over there to... Uh, it's flying at the salmon rings, but the one that's farthest away. Uh, we have some photos, but they're very distant. But enough to get it accepted anyways so it's great so yeah this is a, a great day yesterday we had a, a possible probable booted warbler today things are looking up already seen something we know we've seen which is a the bonaparte skull second for the faroe islands which is amazing i'm glad to be here to be part of that <coughs> so we're, we're working closer to our original plan of getting 100 species and three really good birds for um for the islands yes so does this count as one of them oh indeed it's only the second record so and the first one that i've self-found or co-found with you good job <laughs> so it's awesome okay so <laughs> that was uh that was our um adventure so silas um do you want to take us through your view of your hometown, your home island. Well, yes. Um, birding on the Faroe Islands is amazing. Well, and you you said that it that it requires the patience of a saint. Uh, and um, well, it kind of does. Uh, but it, it's really uh, I've been birding in America, Asia, Middle East, and. Uh, Africa and, and of course the Faroe Islands is probably the most extreme birding I've done um, and it's just you never know when something interesting is going to happen um, I'll just going to find some uh, some good birds for you um, um, you know because the thing is that um, all year round you can find really rare birds uh, do you see the bird on the picture? Yes. It's an oriental turtle now. And uh, I found one uh, a few years ago, only the second record to in the middle of winter. And what I was thinking of doing is just to take you briefly through the seasons, because you can see something all the time, like an oriental turtle now, which is a really good bird in, in Europe. Um, this winter was really harsh, like the coldest winter for 27 years, and we had just snow and ice everywhere. So the water rails even started to walk in the trees, which was really uh, awesome. So we saw quite a few water rails this year. And um, in winter, you can also see the amazing long-tailed ducks that winter around the Faroe Islands uh, as before they move north to Iceland and breed. And um, in winter, I found this bird to the left. If you compare the wing mirror, you can see a difference. It's an American black duck that I actually found in my own village too, just hanging around with the normal mallards. 
the first record for the Faroe Islands and a really, really good bird in, in, uh, in Europe as well. And here, that one we actually, actually saw together, which is a long-tailed duck molting into summer plumage. Really, really nice bird in Odnafjör on the day when the weather was just horrible. And uh, in winter, you, you're really blessed with gulls. The Faroe Islands in winter are just a gull paradise. Here you have the rare uh, rose-seed gull, which is um, a rare visitor, but I found a few of those really, really nice looking birds. And um, great northern divers are common pretty much all year round, especially in winter, you see quite a lot of them. Also a nice bird, more common though. Here you can see it molting into winter plumage when they arrive uh, after, after the breeding season. And imagine seeing that in the UK, Iceland gulls all over the place. Um, and it's very different from year to year how many gulls or Iceland gulls and glaucous gulls we actually see. And this winter has been quite good. Uh, just in my hometown, we have had more than a hundred individuals. So it's quite a good bird. Uh, and you can also found, find the American subspecies called Comlian skull uh, among them. And you always find a few when you check through the flocks of gulls. And actually the one uh, here, uh, the furthest down, you can see it has some brown on the primaries and it's a Comlian skull where the, the, the nominate species has completely white primaries. Um, this winter was also cold, so um, snow buntings were coming down from the mountains. We have a few breeding pairs here. Just a really nice, nice bird. I like the snow buntings quite a lot. Um, here, another male and uh, a female enjoying the snow. Um, and this winter I was really lucky because that's my latest self-found national first. It's a high-built grebe that I found at the uh, Oye. The it's, um, it's a small grebe that has actually flown all the way from North America. And I did not expect to find it on a cold, dark December day, but it, just, it was just hanging around there on... Uh, in the village of Aya on a small lake there. So that's like my newest really, really good bird. Um, so that, that's, that's just how it is in winter. Um, I will um, find the most exciting time of year for me is autumn. That, that's when you really, really find some, something awesome. Um, and um, I'll just share a few pictures. Um, uh, do you see them? We can see them. Yeah. Remember this one? American okay. scooter that David and I found when he was visiting. He was visiting for like a week or so, and we found Bonaparte skull the probable, probable booted warbler and American white-winged gull, which was no, white-winged scoter, which is the second record for the Faroe Islands. So David really has some, some uh, force to him when it comes to find, finding rare birds. So that was a really, really good one. Uh, in autumn, you can also find quite a few other birds from America. This is the long-billed long dovacher. Um, that I just found 10 minutes from home, first national record. And warblers, you can find warblers. Here you got the rare lanceolated warbler. I found this one uh, on the southernmost island. Um, it's just a really, really rare bird. It breeds uh, from Eastern Finland and all the way to Mongolia. But it's just so hard to find because it just runs away from you like a mouse. Um, and then there is the real jewel. It's the Palace's Grasshopper Warbler, which is one of the dream birds that 
every birder wishes to to find because it's just so hard. And I actually managed to to find one of those two. So I found both the lanceolated and the palace's grasshopper warbler on the pharaohs. Um, and uh, another really interesting bird because uh, um, this is a uh, Petrora pipit. Um, and just to show the potential on the Faroe Islands, um, on the 12th of October a few years ago, I found one on the northernmost island uh, or the northernmost village of the Faroe Islands. And I called a friend who was actually doing some, some uh, banding or he was bringing birds in the southernmost village of the Faroe Islands. I called him and I said I had the first Petrora pipit for the Faroe Islands uh, there uh, up in the village and he went out birding and he found the second one on the same day and uh, I called another friend who lives on the second east westernmost island and he went out birding and he found the third one so three <laughs> Petrora pipits in one day it was just amazing um, and here we have the Bonaparte skull that David and I found. And uh, on this picture, you can actually see that there are two of them. Because first there was one, and then a few weeks later, I went to the same place, and now I found two of them together, which was just mind blowing. Um, this is the olive back pipit, which I found uh, a few times at the Faroe Islands, too, which is also a really nice, colorful pipit. And um, probably, probably my the best bird I found myself on the pharaohs. It's a white crowned sparrow. It can it breeds in in uh, in North America, so it has flown all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And this one might even be the subspecies associated with Alaska. So it's a bird that is quite far away from home, and I just found this. 10 minutes away from home on my own island. So <laughs> quite, quite a nice bird. And uh, this is a yellow browed warbler, which is, um, which is pretty much the symbol of autumn birding on the pharaohs. Uh, during a good, a good autumn, I see maybe 150 of these from mid September till late uh, October. A really small bird that breeds in Mongolia and Central Asia. So this one has flown maybe six thousand kilometers away from its um, its uh, breeding areas in Central Asia. So a nice bird. A rarer one is the Arctic warbler. Uh, just this autumn, I found, or the autumn of 2020, I found two of those. Um, and uh, Arctic warblers are much rarer than uh, the yellow brown, but still on the pharaohs, it's if you're out there looking, you'll end up find one. And um, some historical records are like this North American black and white warbler. You know, that's just uh, an amazing bird. It was found in, uh, I didn't find it myself, it was, found, it was in a churchyard. Uh, on the westernmost island of Michenes, a really nice looking bird. And um, during early autumn, uh, if the winds come from the east, we get a lot of migrants that are actually just blown off course from, from central Scandinavia. So like here, when I found uh, four um, uh, common rose finches, including this beautiful male in August on Suinoy, which is one of my favorite islands. It's the second easternmost island on the Faroes. And um, another one I found as a first for the Faroes is this uh, uh, greenish warbler. They're very similar to different warblers, but you need to look at the general size, the eyebrow and the wing bar in order to, to make proper uh, identification. But even they turn up out here. And in some years, you get invasions of different birds, like the parrot crossbill, which where I found the first one for the Faroe Islands. The male is red, and this is the brown female with the yellow rump. Really, really nice birds. I also found the second 
uh, common nightingale uh, for the pharaohs out on Suinai. What is interesting is that it's the second record, but the first record, um, which was actually before I, I was born, was is thought to be of the subspecies Gulsi, which is uh, pr which breeds much much further east than uh, than the um, Luskinia mecarhuncos, uh, which is the nominate species. So quite an awesome bird to find. So in general, just autumn birding on the pharaohs is, you know, you get birds from North America, you get birds from East Asia, you get birds from the Arctic, and you can even get birds from, uh, from uh, the far south. So, so it's really an interesting place to, to, to look for birds, really. I can vouch for that. I remember when I first saw you for that one hour in the rain. Um, <laughs> it was really quite exciting because within moments of shaking your hand and asking you what your name was and how to pronounce it, we, I remember seeing a warbler fly into a bush nearby and there's not many bushes so it's quite easy to point out which, where it was and it was a eastern race of willow warbler so it was quite pale yeah. wasn't it yeah. yeah 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 it's the it's uh it's actually the one we also have in mongolia which is a really really pale gray willow warbler which um which does remind you quite a lot of the um, uh, of many of the chaffinches there but it has the pale legs and it, it's a it's a good bird it's a really good bird. And the other thing we saw, the other birds we saw was we found a pied wagtail, which I believe is quite a scarcity on the Faroe Islands. It is. It is. I've seen less than, well, about five, I guess. Uh, and I've been birding here for for 30 <laughs> years, so, so it's a really good bird. And on that, day, on that day, we also found the gadwall. Yeah. Uh, which Gadwall, makes me, yeah. which, which makes me think the force was strong that day. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, and the gatwall, uh, we even found it on my own island, and I think it was the first gatwall that I've ever seen on the island, on my island. So it was good. It was really good. But you, you mentioned earlier. I mean, I've I'm, well, I've I've said it as well. But you mentioned earlier that it is some of the toughest birding that you can possibly do in many respects can you explain more but let me before you do it let me just tell you how i felt when i was there the second time i came for the week and i was really you know pumped up and hell-bent to, to be with you and co-find a first for the pharaohs and i remember walking um i think it was Suinoy where you were talking about it's a small um I, it's an island but there's a small town in it with basically one street I, I, if i remember rightly and on the pharaohs, you are allowed to walk into people's gardens. Um, as a as someone from England, that you just don't do. So I remember walking, and we were looking in bushes after bush after bush after bush, and occasionally we might find a chiff chaff. Occasionally, uh, we found a few lesser white throats, but one or two from the eastern um, range, so a bit greyer. But it was almost soul destroying because you were walking through areas which you thought would have been, you know, in England or even, you know, anywhere else, there'd be a lot of migrants or just general birds in there. And there was nothing. And I was just clinging on to this hope that you gave me, which was, you know, you're going to see 10 birds, but out of those 10 birds, one might be totally amazing. So you just keep going and keep going. And I remember walking past someone's garden, I was peering over their fence, looking into their garden. And then the door opened and then this big guy, big sort of guy in his 30s, young guy, muscular guy, must have been about seven foot tall. I think his name was Thor or something like that. And he said to me, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm, I, I'm just looking for, but he said, come in my garden. And when you finish, come in for a cup of tea. <laughs> I thought it was incredible. <laughs> oh yeah. So, so yeah, tell us what it's what if you come birding in the Faroe Islands, what can you expect? How I mean in terms of the actual birding itself. How yeah. can you prepare yourself? 
Well, the greatest danger is actually for some someone to invite you for coffee because it takes time away from Bertie. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you, you you pretty much nail it because um, except from sea watching or watching gulls, you don't get large quantities. You must think you, you must know that all of the warblers, all the small passerines that come to the Faroe Islands have flown like six, 700 kilometers across the ocean. So it's quite a few birds that actually make it. Um, so it's not like you get uh, like a thousand warblers to check or go through. But for instance, if we take the Sylvia warblers with like the black cap and the garden warbler, and um, yeah, and the common white throat, lesser white throat. You know, in order to find a barred warbler, which is a good bird actually, uh, in in pretty much most of the UK, you know, you only need to check like ten black caps, and on average, you have found a barred warbler. That's just how common they are, and the ratio of rare birds is just unbelievable uh, compared to everywhere else. So I think you can say that, you know, if you're checking shorebirds uh, in, in the Wattensee in Denmark, or if you're checking uh, in our southern UK, you know, here you only have to check a few birds in order to find the really, really good ones, um, except on a few occasions. Like this autumn, we had just perfect, perfect conditions for three days. And I was barely able to leave my own village because there were just birds everywhere, you know, just sitting on the roofs and, you know, just cramping together in a few bushes, you know, where there really were the large quantities, but hitting, a, you know, a real fall um, uh, or arrival like that rarely happens and therefore you go to Swina, you change you check five birds and one of them is like literally i had five birds out there this autumn on one occasion and i found one paddy field warbler and one common rose finch and three chiff chaffs you know <laughs> which is quite good <laughs> uh after all um so um coming here you 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 need to adjust your mindset really, because you're not getting a lot of quantities. Uh, but you need to check every tree, every garden. Uh, and if, if there is just a few birds, you know, the rare, the chance for the mega rarity is still very real. Um, and you just have to check garden number 99 and continue to garden number 100. Uh, and eventually you will find something really good. Uh, I would say it's impossible to do proper birding from mid-September to late October for a week on the Faroe Islands without finding even what's considered a really good UK rarity uh, eventually. And if you if you really want to get into that position where you're not just twitching something that someone else has found, but you actually bring yourself into a situation where you actually have to have real knowledge about chain, knowing the difference between a yellow-browed warbler, a greenish warbler, an arctic warbler, uh, you know. Well, then you must come to the Faroe Islands because you really need those things because you find the bird. It's there for you to identify and nobody else has seen it and probably no one else will see it either. And uh, it's both, you know, really good eastern birds but also you need to know the american warblers the american sparrows because eventually they turn up too um and yeah just don't don't stay at home go out there and check and check even though the weather is horrible because it will pay off eventually it's it, it seems like a, a bit of a connoisseur's uh, spot for birders in other words uh, for birding should I say otherwise in other words um, during the sort of peak 
times for finding rarities, i.e. during the autumn, um, as you say, you need to have a knowledge in a way. And when I was there with you working in those gardens every day and looking everywhere every day and looking at everything every day, even I, who consider myself very patient and observant, I found it tough. I mean, I remember on day three, I was doing a daily blog. Day one, I'm, yeah, we're here on the, on, on the Faroe Islands and we're really looking forward to finding something today. Day three, it's like, oh, uh, we're here on the Faroe Islands. Uh, it's getting, I mean, I had bags, bags under my eyes at this point as well. We're getting, you know, it's, it's tough. It can actually make or break you. And I think, as you say, it's the thing that keeps you going if you're looking for, for finding new birds. Is, is, is the fact that your ratios are much lower than you would be if you were somewhere else. Um, what I noticed was most birds were either your Ferraris race of the common starling, yeah. which is the biggest uh, race of starling, isn't it? Common starling. Yeah, in the world, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And you can actually see it's discernibly bigger. Um, so there's this common starling, there's the rock pipit, which was everywhere. Yeah. Um, uh, there's like five species I, I remember that were kind of everywhere um, and then that was it mm. <laughs> and then anything yeah. else anything else could be something interesting so yeah. that what well, that's the thing that drove us and plus the sea watching was superb as well I remember us watching a whole ton of fulmers flying past um, you also took me to the place where you have the storm petrels breeding can you tell us about yeah. that? Yeah, they, well, they, they breed actually on all the rat-free islands. Uh, the European storm petrel, maybe half of the world's population breeds on the Faroe Islands. Um, but you, you need to come there during the night in order to see them, or, unless you, you go uh, offshore on a boat. But, you know, for bird watchers, the Faroe Islands are two different things. Because you can come during the breeding season, and you can have awesome views of gannets, of guillemots, of uh, black guillemots, of, um, you know, razor bills, and uh, especially puffins, uh, kittiwakes, and, you know, you can just see gazillions of seabirds, uh, you know, which is really a very nice experience. Um, but the autumn birding, finding the rarities is, is something that yeah, as you say, it could break you or it could really uh, make you, uh, you know, turn you on uh, to, in order to to uh, uh, to find your own really good stuff. Because basically, I think that, you know, uh, one of the best lists of self-found species in all of Europe Um you know, because I just get to find so many species uh, that, well, that are, of course, seen in, in other places. But, you know, here I get to find them myself. And um, even though I, I do twitch if there is a new bird that I haven't seen on the pharaohs, 93% uh, of my pharaohs lists are made up of birds that I found myself, you know. And if you try to get a good British list without twitching at all and only counting the birds that you find yourself, you would be quite far behind, um, you know, in, in the UK. How, how does the Faroe Islands compare? Do you know, I mean, you may not know this, the answer to this question, but how does it compare to places like Shetland, for example? If, if Shetland was only inhabited by five birders, would it be the same kind of thing? Or do you think Shetland gets more or do you get more? Um, it's actually quite a hard question. Because um, uh, I've compared, you know, with Faroe Islands, uh, uh, Fair Isle, for instance. And most days, they have higher quantities than we have. Uh, and they are uh, closer to, to, to Scandinavia. Uh, so, uh, so uh, they do get more birds, but it's like they have one island, which is one quarter of the size of Sweeney, where we walked, where you said there's this one street, right? 
and you have i don't know how many people doing the the regular routines there so so we have uh, a much bigger area to check um that's one thing and during the right conditions we do get more birds than shetland uh, especially when we have east to north easterly winds we have um, we have um, uh, yeah i would say already at least to get more birds than shetland and of course there is the the joker with the american birds where obviously the fair islands should be more uh prone to to receive birds from from um, from north america uh, given that the uh, uh, the winds hit right uh, but of course there are many more recorded on shetland simply because there are no people here watching in relevant places um yeah and and talking about no people do you get many birders from overseas coming birding any sort of european birders british birders even uh re quite rarely actually most birders come during summer to experience uh breeding birds and it, it it's um it's actually quite rare to 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 have uh, people coming i do arrange tours for people who want to come in autumn uh and uh but you know, even during prime time, you know, you have some years where nobody is actually showing up. So, um, so the thing is, you, you got pretty much everything to yourself. And, you know, the reason why you're allowed to look into people's gardens is just because you don't have a thousand birds doing that or a hundred birds doing that. It's just a, uh, it's, <laughs> Yeah, people don't get tired of birders because there are so few of them, right? And um, uh, yeah, so so it's really, really underburdened. And uh, locals going out finding rare birds could be counted on one hand or less, you know. What stops foreign birders from coming in? Why the, is it the expense? Is it the stigma attached to the islands? Is it that they don't know that much about it? Is it that they've well, got their own patches they just want to look at? You know, uh, you know, just to, uh, to be, uh, to make a little fun of it, you know, I, I suggested that um, the birds seen on the Faroe Islands could be counted on the Danish list. Because uh, the thing is in Shetland, you know, you can count, you can count it on your UK list. And a lot of birders are, unfortunately, very focused on their bird li birding lists, you know. They want to see as many birds as possible in the UK, you know. So uh, if the Faroe Islands had been, you know, under UK rule, like Shetland, you know, I can promise you we would have a lot of birders here now. Um, and the Faroe Islands are semi-autonomous, uh, but still in... Uh, as a, uh, still a part of the Danish kingdom, but well, consensus is that you cannot count your birds, uh, you know, on your Danish list. Um, and well, it makes good sense, but it also means that, you know, during absolute prime time, you know, those who are really keen to find their own stuff, they want to do it on, uh, on the Silly Islands or do it on Shetland or out on Fowler, uh, you know, they want to find their own birds where, you know, it gives a little more street cred probably than, than you know, just finding them on the Faroe Islands. Well, have it, let it be known, but I'm going to join you again one day on the Faroes uh, one autumn, yeah. one day, should I say one week, um, yeah. to check out uh, what we can find. Um, and I also okay. need to tell you, when you were here, you were actually one or two weeks away from prime time, actually, because it exploded after you left. You need, you know, from the last week of September till 20th of October, that's where the real magic is happening. And you came quite early in September. <laughs> All right, next time, next time. Yeah, <laughs> good. Uh, what's your favorite bird, Silas? 
that's a really really hard question uh my favorite bird is the snowy owl which i've never seen uh and it's just it's really my boogie bird um the favorite bird that i have seen is uh, it's hard but it's probably the, the siberian ruby throat dream bird it's, a, it's amazing um uh, i really want to see one i want to find one on the Faroe islands it's been recorded in iceland and uh, it's been recorded quite a few times on Shetland now. It has to come here eventually, and I want to find it. <laughs> you <Well>, know, <coughs> excuse me. Well, it's one of those birds, Zoomers. If you don't, if you don't know about it, you should check it out because it's one of those birds you just have to dream about and hopefully see one day. Yeah. Um, if you could be anywhere on this planet, notwithstanding the current pandemic, where would you be right now? Um, well, uh, I live in Mongolia, uh, uh, but because of Corona, we're back on the Faroe Islands right now. Um, but if I could be anywhere in the world, you know, you know, seeing the blue footed boobies in, uh, in Galapagos or something like that would be amazing. And I, I have this species uh, or this list of hundred birds that I need to see in my lifetime like the uh so many of them um you know the 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 Veros eagle for instance i really really want to see that swallow tailed um uh kite um just a lot of those really really nice birds that i would love to see but i must see say that my favorite birding is being on a small island not able to go anywhere and just work really hard to find something awesome fantastic that's a great great <laughs> attitude um zoomers let me just give you the latest slowdown in terms of who's coming next um on uh in conservation with we've got a few interesting <coughs> excuse me interesting people coming up um on thursday the uh, 11th of march we have joe uh, harkness who's going to be talking well, he's written a book called Bird Therapy, which was all about um, overcoming or trying to overcome mental health issues using the therapy of birding. So he's going to be talking with us on Thursday the 11th. On Monday the 15th of March, um, we've got an amazing young woman called Selena Chain. Um, she is um, a young woman who is a photographer. She's also a, a very avid conservationist. And she'll be talking about decolonizing conservation not only on a racial side of things, but for, for women and for, you know, all sorts of stuff. So it'd be a very interesting conversation there. On uh, Thursday, the 18th of March, we have none other than Margaret Atwood. And that's going to be an amazing evening. I've um, I had a good chat with her last night, actually, and she's great fun. And I told her that she's going to have the night off when she comes. We're not going to be talking about books or writing. We're going to be talking about birding we're going to be talking about the environment climate change all that sort of stuff which is very close to her, her heart so we'll be talking on the 18th of march please book up if you haven't because that's going to be a big night um, and so i don't want you guys to miss out and on the 25th of march uh mary colwell um, who's written a book about curlews will be talking about saving the curlew um so and also the uh in england we have a potential for an examination at school on natural history which she is spearheading the government to try and get that through so we'll be talking with her about that as well so we've got some really good stuff coming up um right now it's time for us to say good evening and good night and good morning and good afternoon thank you very much for joining us on this in conservation with episode silas my man you are amazing i love the fact that you're a finder and I, you know, it's great. You, you inspire me when I go birding anywhere to just look at that one extra bush, just keep going, push yourself that bit further. So thank you for your inspirational talk on the Faroe Islands. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Great. And Zoomers, 
lovely to have you as ever. I um, really appreciate your company. Thanks for joining in. Um, take care of yourself. And as I always say, keep looking up.